Okay. So, real quick, uh, thank you everybody who uh, is tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to do something like this. Thank you to Subak and everybody over there for putting this together. Thank you to my buddy Lalo for being a part of this. Um, like I said, I'm really excited to be a part of something like this and just open up conversation. So, um, yeah, I am Bobby Marines. I am an artist from Rob Sound, Texas, uh, born and raised, but living in Minnesota, living and working in Minnesota. And, um, yeah, and then this is my boy Lalo. Well, like you heard, my name is Lalo. Uh, my name is actually Lael Martinez. I was born in Michoacan, Mexico, but actually immigrated to uh, LA when I was uh, a baby and uh, basically moved here to Minnesota in uh, 01 and uh, been here ever since. And yeah. this is uh, my brother from another mother. Yeah, we, we've actually known each other before, like the art thing before, uh, I mean, oh, yeah. way back when I first moved to Minnesota, uh, we had uh, similar friends, so we hung out a lot. And uh, yeah, so Lalo knows me from before any of this stuff. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so what I want to do real quick is uh, go through some of the work I've been I've been working on, uh, some of my latest stuff, and then we're gonna just go into a conversation with like three pieces that I'm gonna move back here as focal points or like pieces to uh, like jump off of. But uh, yeah, so let's uh, walk you through some of this stuff real quick. Yeah. You can, you can turn the camera. Oh, turn it? Yeah. How do I turn it? Right here. Uh, one second. Yeah, my fault, people. Nah, nah, nah. Don't <laughs> worry about it. Okay. So these are some uh, charcoal watercolor pieces I did, I think, a few months back. And so one of my biggest things is. Um, reintroducing the Chicano identity into, into uh, society, like re especially the street Chicano identity into society in a different, uh, different framing, different context, and a little more to go off of as far as um, uh, a background and, and all that for understanding, you know? So these pieces were inspired by prison photos that my family would take uh, you know, they would do uh, these fancy landscapes in the background, and like, it was like this, like this weird form of like escapism, you know. And uh, they were in their photos with their family. They were trying to represent any other background, any other reality than where they actually were at the time. So I did these pieces. These were actually a couple of prison photos. I did, uh, I did these pieces inspired by that, you know, in my way of. Uh, changing their landscape, their physical landscape, their societal landscape. Um, that's what these pieces were. And uh, let's see, then this one right here, this is a buddy of mine um, who is doing time. He just recently got out. He's actually a really good friend of mine, my boy. Uh, he's right now working on uh, a nonprofit called Artists Against Drug Abuse. Uh, he's currently working on that, uh, working on a few other projects. Great artist, great, uh, my boy Eloy, he's a great uh, writer and everything. But regardless of all that, uh, he has face tattoos and on record, he, he might not look like the ideal person. And what I wanted to do with like this swash of like just brown, different shades of brown, was represent how no matter, regardless of how we see ourselves or how we're growing, we're still in large part, just swatches of brown. Um, so that was that piece. And uh, then I got, I came across a lot of big pieces of wood. And I started to think about wood. And we're, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about essentialism and essential people, essential workers. And I started thinking about the essential nature of wood. And I wanted to create a series on, the, on these big pieces. So this first one was just, um, based on a photo of an old friend of mine um, who actually like childhood crushes. And uh, she was like one of my, she was like my first girlfriend or whatever. We were really, we were really young. It was whatever, but uh, sadly now she lives a completely different life and, and, and um, you know, drugs took her down the wrong path. And, and uh, I, I made this piece like as as a piece for her, an homage or something, um, 
also referencing like the Mary Magdalene, Virgin Mary, pure purity, a pure figure. I use that also as an inspiration. Um, and this is a, a, a photo that she had online. And um, these, if you look closely, these brown marks, all these small knots in the wood, they were brown, dark brown uh, knots. Um, but I covered them with confetti, with playful confetti, because to me it represents like an innocence or like this, this need to go back to childhood to when we both knew each other before the drugs got in the way, you know, and they, they, they resemble track marks. They resemble track marks, you know, and if you ever seen some of these track marks who shot up, uh, you know, that they're, they're callous and they're dark and they're, they're, they're just scarred. And this is me like kind of like telling her like, it's okay. Like, I still remember you, like the innocence you and the you before all this. And um, that, that, that's what inspired this piece. Um, so then we go to these pieces. This uh, was a photo I took uh, in New York. It was in uh, Times Square. You know how they have, uh, if you've ever been, you know, they have cartoon characters there taking pictures with kids and stuff. Um, and if you catch a glimpse of any one of them uh, lifting up their head, their helmet thing, you know that a lot of them are like uh, people of color. And one of them that I took a picture of was uh, a Mexican dude. And I took a picture of him and just caught a glimpse of him. But I created this piece to represent how, how not only him, but he represented like us as a people. We are behind the scenes a lot and, and often seen sometimes as like um, not taken seriously. We aren't taken seriously and we're behind the scenes of a lot of things that go on in the country. And, um, and I surrounded it with aluminum foil because the aluminum foil, it's gonna be a recurring thing in my new work uh, because it, it, it resembles the uh, blankets that the kids use in the detention centers, the immigration detention centers. Um, so I wanted to put that because it's like, this is his, 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 his people's, our people's reality surrounding him, engulfing him as he's trying to make a living here in, here in America. Now this piece right here, uh, it's a picture of my siblings and I, that was a reference photo. And again, it's, it's uh, inspired by immigration um, or it's speaking on exploring immigration. And the, the images here were, again, there's swatches of, of brown, different shades of brown because there's no identity. They're not respecting us as individual people. The systems aren't uh, respecting us as such. So, um, the, these uh, pieces of aluminum foil again reference the the, the uh, blankets that they use in the detention centers, and these eyes, these faces, were inspired by original drawings that were done by kids in the immigration center. I looked at some of their artwork, and one of the things I thought of was like, "Whoa, what kind of faces?" I instantly wanted to see like whether they put smiling or sad or happy faces on their kids on the kids' drawings because you know, kids won't hold that back. So I looked and there are no mouths. There are no mouths, just eyes. I thought that was really, really sad that they couldn't even put an exp expression on the faces of the people, of the kids. Uh, so I use those faces as inspiration for these. Um, and underneath you see the confetti because that's their innocence, their playfulness, their childhood, trying to like sneak out, trying to like bleed out underneath their circumstances. Um, and again, the, the green background is inspired by the mats that they sleep on, those flat green mats. Um, and eventually I think what I'm doing is I'm actually gonna be building, this gonna be like layered, like brick. It's gonna be all the way across, but it's gonna be like three, two, three, two. Um, and it's gonna be like brick, but it's only gonna go up to here. And it's gonna look like it's just about to engulf them, um, you know, a wall. And I, I might do the bricks uh, red, white, and blue. I'm not sure yet, but those are the pieces I'm working on. Well, that's that one. So, then this one. Okay, so this body of work is called Snow and Cotton, right? And the, the way I came up with the idea for the title is uh, snow being um, Minnesota is covered in snow. The land, right, the, the white thing on the ground is snow. And in Texas, the white thing on the ground is cotton. And I'm surrounded by cotton in our, in our cotton in, in our fields surrounding my, my hometown. 
Cotton Fields, our hometown is a, our mascots, the Cotton Pickers. That's a whole other issue we'll get into later. But um, so this represents the, the, me exploring the differences between Minnesota and Texas and I, uh, the identity of uh, um, predominantly white Minnesota, predominantly Hispanic uh, Robstown, Texas. So when you think of cotton, you think more utilitarian, dirty, uh, hard working uh, field thing that you have to like pull apart and convert into something useful. Um, when you think of snow, at least to us, it was always whimsical and fantastical and magical and um, something that, that, that had a lot of positive connotations um, right off top. So then this became this big uh, thing about um, race and, and, uh, and uh, just society and systems and everything else and, and Latino identity. So um, that's kind of what I was trying to come up with on this piece. The reference photo is my grandmother and her sisters working in the fields. It's an actual photo um, that I referenced. And uh, you know, you have snow falling from the ground, you have cotton on the on the on the ground. This is actual like dirt and twigs from here. Um, you have pastel charcoals and all that. And uh, if you see this string, this string, I'm actually gonna glue it later. Um, but it, right here at the end, it's gonna be gold. I'm gonna spray paint it gold to uh, hint at uh, the story of Rumpelstiltskin <laughs> because I, I feel like that's kind of like what the American dream ended up becoming for a lot of the immigrants that came and our, our abuelitas and abuelitos and them, you know, they, they saw something better for, for us and for our children um, and made this deal to work within this system that is now taking their firstborns and their secondborns and locking them down into this system that serves mostly not them. So uh, yeah, that's that's what that one is. This one is just real, uh, a lot more conceptual. Um, I just took the pieces of wood, again, essential part of the land, just very, very raw as is. This to me is like immigrants when they, right when they come over. Right when they come over, they appear that it's them. It's a lot more of their cultures embedded within them, and they remember all their stories and, and everything else. And uh, but at the same time, they're propped up. They're propped up on this piece in in a way that's ready to get weaponized, you know, in, in a way that's ready to get used again, utilitarian. Um, they're propped up like shock tools or like ammunition. Um, and then when you see this next piece. This is now assimilation. You know, this is everybody who's, they, they've already been here, they've already, you know, got their job, they're into their, they've, they've gotten into the cookie cutter part of the system. And now just keep your head down and don't make a fuss, you know. And uh, again, this is different shades of, of uh, Chicano, uh, Mexican American, Hispanic, Latino people, Latinx people. Um, and these pieces of wood were, um, actually from my old job, my old factory job. Uh, I don't know how I came across these pieces of wood, but um, I think it was, I find that like really, really um, ironic that it ended up being these pieces. Cause I felt really trapped in that, in that job and dealt with a lot of racism there. So um, these were like the perfect pieces to use for that. So um, yeah, that's pretty much a summary of what I've been working on right now. I mean, there's some sculpture and some 3D pieces, uh, but for the most part, these are the 2D pieces. Right now I'm limited on space. So this is what I've been working on. And uh, yeah, it's been really interesting exploring, exploring everything, like all, like what it all means, especially now and today and the significance and opening these conversations with, with me, with my people, um, with other people, and building bridges of um, understanding and just, just opening up good conversation around these topics. I feel like now more than ever, it's like an ideal time to to just uh, just talk about these things and just um, hear other people's perspectives. So on that note, 
I'm gonna just put up a piece right here, and then me and my boy Lalo are just gonna go into some conversation, uh, and uh, about a few different topics, and then we'll open it up for questions. You want to put it? You can change the change the uh, uh, angle a bit. Alright, so I don't know if y'all can see it that good. I don't know how much I want to like drag this forward. But um, so the first thing I wanted to kind of cover and just talk about uh, is uh, the criminal justice system, especially the criminal justice justice system. Growing up Chicano, growing up the way we grew up, um, and just some of the factors that 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 play a role in in our lives and our decision making and whatever, um, not justifying anything, not rationalizing anything, just talking about factors that come into play um, when navigating our experiences. So um, right off top, like, okay, for instance, like, like, like when was the first time you got locked up? When was the first time you got locked up in like a, what do you feel was uh, the main thing? What are some of the reasons why you feel uh, you ended up in that situation? Yeah. Well, the first time I got locked up wasn't the first time I uh, got caught for a crime. But to answer your question, bro, the first time I got locked up was back in 96, I believe, not 97. So I was still fairly young, you know, and uh, but the first time, well, the circumstances of that was, uh, uh, you know, a couple of friends and I, a couple of kids, you know, from the neighborhood. I grew up in uh, East, uh, East South Central Los Angeles. We uh, basically uh, committed a robbery. And uh, with that happening, you know, we got hemmed up, took us to the station, took us to juvie. And that was the first time experiencing actual lockup. To answer your question, that answer. Yeah, yeah. And and what do you think uh and was it like something you felt like you had to do? Or was it like a no nah, it was just like Nah to to tell you the truth, Bobby Looks, it was just more something that uh it was circumstantial, you could say. Um circumstan circumstantial in the aspect that uh you know we uh there wasn't uh there weren't very many programs. There weren't uh, many opportunities uh, growing up in that environment already, experiencing what I had already experienced or we had experienced already. That's kind of what we fell into. And do you feel like it was it was like home life that played a part in it? Or do you feel like it was mostly like, it didn't matter what the home life was when you stepped out into the street, it was different? Or yeah, you know, it's just like with any other individual, you know, home life is gonna play a role to yeah. a certain extent. Um, in my case, uh, somewhat, but then I guess I, I, then again, I understand my parents' situation and circumstance. Yeah. So no, but basically to get to what you were saying, though, uh, no, once you step outside, it's a whole different world, no matter what's going on in your home. It's, uh, you know, it's the people you chase, you choose to hang with. Uh, but sometimes it's not who you choose to hang with. It just falls onto you and yeah. so on and so on, bro. So it's just home life does play a role however it's not everything it's the environment outside more so that pulls you into that situation i think i yeah i think you have a really good point like me i will see me my home life played a role too because i grew up like going through like special classes and gifted talented drawing classes yep. and all that yep. but then my parents separated and i had like this rebellion hit me and i reached this point where it was like gonna be school or the streets and my way of rebelling like I felt like I felt like I was angry and I didn't know who at who but like right. my mother for sure like I was angry at her because I just felt like uh she wasn't around as much as I needed her to be or uh, my dad wasn't around you know my dad was in prison and I just felt like my way of rebelling 
was was uh, hanging out with other people that yeah. my mom wouldn't. But also, there was nobody else, like there was nobody else really that 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 uh, I felt connected to or like I wanted to hang out with and um, like that I could feel like part of. I didn't feel like I was part of a family when my parents right. separated. So I feel like being part of at least a, a little group or a gang or whatever yep. felt like I was part of, like, these are my brothers. They look out for me. Like, you know, we struggled together. We yep. were poor together. We were hungry together. And um, oh, that creates a bond, bro. And then that, it creates a bond. Yep. So then you feel like whatever bad things or whatever you're doing, you're in good hands. And it, it's like you justify it to a certain extent. Yeah, and then that's where the morality starts to like yep. take a twist, yep. you know, and it's just like, okay, right or wrong, well, who's going to tell me? Right. How, how's my mom going to tell me that this is wrong when she's not even there for me Straight right up. now? Yeah, yep. How's my dad going to tell me he's in prison? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So then it, it becomes this thing like, okay, well, then no one's going to tell me anything. Yeah, after that's that. how it becomes. Uh, and uh, so I, like that, I feel like the, the world plays a big role. Um, home life um growing up poor is a big one oh, that's, a, that's a major that's a big factor most definitely like when you grow up like embarrassed like i remember i used to go with like the same clothes that i had uh it, and, and it wasn't washed and my clothes would stink and i remember i used to have grass things on my pants mm -hmm. and i would tell my aunt i specifically I, I remember this one time i told my aunt to drive around the school till uh after recess so i could lie and say that my pants got dirty at recess Damn. you know and uh and having to deal with with the shame and all that of being poor and having to like chew roaches out of your cereal before oh, you yeah. put the milk in oh yeah i remember you know, all that yeah, yeah, like, bro. trying to like and, and dealing with all these deep insecurities and you felt like there was nothing you could hold on to to make you feel powerful and then you come across like Tupac or like whatever, like this music and everything yeah, that sure. was like fuck everybody and like it's whatever, blah blah blah, fuck up. Yeah, and I have been through some shit. That's the first time I heard somebody validate my poverty. Straight up. Like Tupac. Yeah. That yeah. and that's how we came up with the title of this uh Troublesome ninety six. Yeah, Troublesome ninety six. Yep. The first time I, I, I was able to like heard somebody validate my poverty was through hip hop. Yeah. And I was like, Oh shit, so you can find like power in this. And uh, but then it started to take turn from power to like you know, going down and like that, taking it the wrong way. But, um, so, so then, so then it plays a role in, in your decision making. Yeah. Your morality. Yeah. Right. So, so going back to what you were just a quick little recap on to what you just said or touching the subject, the, the subject that you just said, bro. You know, just going back to the whole dress issue, you know, the clothing issue and the uh, embarrassment and mm -hmm. all that other, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a uh, lack of uh, self-esteem and whatnot and this and this and that or whatever, you know, just like a quick little with me and hi mom. I know I saw you, uh, you tuned in. No, no disrespect moms. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my mom wanted to keep me, her little boy, as long as she could. Yeah. And in South Central, South Central LA, you can't do that. Me, I didn't have any brothers. I had four sisters, three at that time. One wasn't even born yet. But it's just like, you, uh, with me, she wanted to dress me a certain way. And that, that you know what I'm saying? I'm already taking it with the homies or yeah. you certain individuals. Yeah, so it was like, I'm over here looking, you know, like, 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 a, like a weirdo amongst, you know, the homies or, you know. Yeah. And it's just like, it, it, it changed my mind frame too. You know, I was like, oh, no, I got to get my shit right. And it, and it turned to what you were saying, bro, it's like, I dressed extreme. I went from one extreme of like, looking like my mom's little boy to looking just, you know, big ass baggy clothes, you know, which was popular at that time, yeah. um, creased up. Anybody who knows me remembers, y'all know what time it is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I, I used to crease my shirt, my fucking pants, yeah. my, uh, excuse my uh, language there, but uh, you know, the whole point is, my self-esteem my ego was took a hit was it was so it was it was bruised or it was hurt to the extent to where i'm not gonna let you see me raggedy like that again or i'm not gonna let you clown on me like that again look at me now and yeah. you know it, it, but it's because your ego's bruised 
you're hurt. What, and, and I think that's what, like, a lot of that, like, kicks off a lot of things. Because but you never admit that. No, no, hell no. But it's like we always, from then on, we have something to prove. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We feel like we have something to prove. Whether, yep. whether we have to prove that we are... Uh, uh, yes. Can, can fight, dress or can. yeah, can fight, or we don't, or we don't give a shit about what you think, what or you uh, or like we'll handle business. Like, so we always have something to prove yeah. from then on out, and uh, I think that like coupled with with a lot of other things like create this this spiral. Like me, uh, my mom ended up moving. She ended up. Um, like we ended up moving in with my grandmother and like moving from spot to spot. Uh, I ended up living with my aunt for 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 a little bit because uh, they caught me stealing. Um, we actually, I actually used to steal food from my brothers and sisters. Um, we were so poor, and um, I used to have a grocery list and tell my homeboys like, "Hey, you steal the milk, you steal the bread, you steal the cheese," and all this for my brothers and sisters, and then uh, and then feed them that way. Um, but then they caught me stealing one time and they kicked me out of town to live with my aunt. But uh, then uh, it like, I don't know, from then on out, it was just like something, like it was just something like you felt like you had to prove yeah. something. Yeah, and it like becomes a vicious to... cycle. That's and before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're doing it subconsciously, you know what I'm saying? Without yeah. even thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so when my mom left, uh, she left for a while. That's how we lived in Minnesota. She met somebody, she left, she moved. And my brothers and sisters, we were all dispersed. Like I live with my aunt, my 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 brothers and sisters, my grandmother, and we all lived separately. And my mom was far away. My dad was in prison or just getting out. Um, so there was really no direction. And so I just became more embedded in the streets. Like like there was even that much more to prove. Like it was like, if my mom don't give a shit, my dad's gone. Well, fuck that. Like how do I get attention for one? So yeah. I used to get in trouble in school for one because I was my way of seeing my dad. If I would get in a fight, my dad would like pick up the phone or he'd call or he'd be like, "Hey, well, his only question would be like, hey, did you kick his ass?' Or you know, whatever." That was my way of bonding with my dad. I was like, "Oh, though, so that's love." So, th <laughs> so then that that again it comes down to morality and your perception of morality. It warps it. So I was like, "Okay, so there's love. That's per percep uh, That's yeah, a way it's of your perception love, of right? love, bro. Yeah." And then like with my mom, it was like I would clean the house or whatever. And then I left. Um, and it became to where I didn't want, I didn't, I was so mad at my mom for leaving. Okay. I didn't want anything to do with her. So everything from then on out was a rebellion that, yeah. against her. So um, I remember I was a teenager, like 14 years old, not gonna lie. Um, and my mom told me when I was little, she was like, promise me you'll never, ever, ever try heroin. <laughs> never try heroin. That thing will kill you in one shot, you'll die. Please, I was like, all right, all right, mom, okay. Um, well, by this time, I'm a teenager, and I hadn't even tried cigarettes at this time. The, fuck gateway drugs, all that. We went straight to the hard portion. And it happened like this. Um, I remember um, a friend of mine had some, like, in this, like, Visine bottle or something. And uh, sorry if this is, like, triggering or, or whatever to anybody, but um, right before they offered it, uh, they were like, okay, you gotta lean your head back and on count of three, you're gonna just snort it or whatever. And I was like, I was like, fuck, this is that shit that my mom said would kill me. <laughs> and I was like, but then then another vision came in my head. I was like, fuck that, she don't even care. I haven't even talked to her in months. Okay. Like, so then it became a direct act towards against I her. Was, you know? So I, would th I thought about her and I was like, all right, fuck it, let's go. And that's how that's how I saw it. And it was reckless and it was crazy, but it it got me so deep into the spiral and I I kept going on that and numbed out all my feelings because you have to numb out. Yeah, no, that's, that's, not, that's a good way to do it. I mean, because not a positive way, but a way to do it. And it's not like you don't have emotions or like you don't give a fuck about nobody or like you don't care anymore. Right. You do, but you have to, you have to suppress, suppress them. that so hard yep. and you have to fight against every instinct that you have as yep. a good person uh, yo, to, survive, to survive, yes. that, to fight. To Absolutely. commit crime, yep. to defend yourself, to be violent, you have to fight every instinct that you have as a oh, positive yeah. person. Most definitely. So you live with this inner conflict, and the only way to survive on that is by numbing out yeah. with drugs, with smoking, uh -huh. with drinking. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. Yeah. So, so did you yeah. spend a lot of time like in and out, like in and out of jail? Did you drop out of school? Yeah, man. As a matter of fact, bro, you already know. We've been told you. I mean, I 
we've had this conversation millions of times, but uh, I'm sharing it with you guys. Uh, yeah, I actually dropped out in the uh, eighth grade. Right after eighth grade, what I say is I uh, we went out, we went on vacation, and I stayed on vacation. Uh, yeah, you know, unfortunately, I used to be a good student too. You know, uh, I used to get A's and B's, and you know, uh, by like sixth grade ish, I basically stopped giving a fuck, stopped caring, and uh, let my grades start dwindling. So seventh and eighth were just basically me just. I don't know, I guess just trying to, I guess, uh, I was trying to be a better person because I had already gotten charges, I was on probation, and I was trying, but like what we were just talking about, bro, is like, I ended up catching another charge, I, I just kept on doing things, and uh, lost that sense of morality, and I uh, had to suppress all those senses that you just spoke about, bro, and it's just like, yeah, so I ended up dropping out in the eighth grade, uh, after the eighth grade or whatever, they try to put me in a little alternative school here and there. Never worked yeah. at all. And, uh, but yeah, bro, I ended up dropping out. I mean, just due to the, I mean, I thought I had to figure it out, but obviously, well, I didn't because I ended up going to college, uh, I, even without having any high school at all. But uh, took a placement test. Uh, obviously, I was ready since like eighth grade, maybe even, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, bro? Yeah. But I mean, yeah, dog, I, I I ended up dropping out in the eighth grade after the eighth grade and um yeah, man, I just Did I, you did you ever feel like uh like when you dropped out, did you ever feel like this like like you always wanted to go back somehow or did you ever did you have this thirst for knowledge even though you were in the streets? Absolutely. Look, uh I I ain't gonna lie, I didn't never I never wanted to go back to you know what I'm saying, the, that program. Yeah, I didn't yeah. ever want to do like that first that systemic all that bullshit. I, I I knew back then I already didn't want it. Yeah. Especially living the way I was living, I was like, I right, this ain't for me. Yeah. Uh, the only the only reason I like going to school, high school, I want to go to school was for the girls, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And maybe get a little fight here and there. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. my that was my focus. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh but, but yes, to answer your question, bro, uh yeah, every you know, I was a type uh ever since i was little bro uh i don't know if i've ever shared this with you or not but i love to read that you do know yeah, i love to yeah, read absolutely. but ever since i was little even in la i used to read the billboards so every huh. time we went from one extreme point of la to another and one, 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 whatever i was always not only reading the walls which had writing yeah but the billboards you know what i'm saying so it always caught my attention. Literature, I guess you can say. Yeah. Literature always caught my attention. And yeah, it, it, to get to where we were at, even though I dropped out after the eighth grade, I was a man, I was always reading one way or another. Yeah. One way or another, yes, I always had that thirst for knowledge. Yeah, I think I think me too. And I also dropped out in eighth grade and I we didn't really have books in my grandma's house, but I would read like the phone book and like uh the phone book, I would read, I mean, whatever. I, I think I found a trigonometry book one time and just started yeah, going through that. I don't want to interrupt you, but, but no, look, speaking ahead. of, you've been to my mom's house. Yeah. You know what was a main, a big thing? What? The encyclopedias. Oh, I love those. Mom's, thank you. Yeah, bro, we had, she bought a set of encyclopedias when we used to live on 48th and Avalon, East Side. You already know, East Side 48, you know, <laughs> 663. Yeah, yeah. This, East, you already know, anyway. Um, so y'all had the encyclopedias there? Yeah, bro, my mom bought a, uh, a set of encyclopedias. And um, you know what? I've I've read every single one of them from back, from Damn. front to back. I see, and I used to I used to think that I was like the only kid that would go crazy for the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica commercials. I used to look at those like, man, I would love like one of those books or like the, the set. I was yeah. super surprised when my mom bought them one day. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I was really like, what the? But you know, I yeah, I was I was ecstatic about it. Cause I, it was just yeah. yeah, man. So so then, so then you were in and out. You were locked up a couple of times. Oh, I've been locked up more than a couple of times. And then I you mean, were through all my lifetime. Yeah, more than a couple. Of and times. then more than I like to admit. Yeah, and then you came to Minnesota, and there was still a lot, of, still a lot of the same when we met. We oh, were yeah. still in the street. Oh, we were doing basically type of lifestyle. Uh, we met in Oatana. Yep. Uh, we actually, our first couple of encounters where we were going to fight each other. <laughs> uh, and um, we were still in all that. And, and, but my thing is, when did your perspective start to change? Or when did, like, the, like the inner you, like, the, the, like, when did 
your your morality start to show itself again in different ways and more positive ways or like like uh like for instance for me mm -hmm. it started before i moved when i when i was still in texas i mean i've been in more fights than i can count mm -hmm. but my last few fights i used to uh i remember at first i used to be like hyped up like yeah yeah, yeah boom i got whatever whatever uh then i started my last few fights i started to feel this deep sense of remorse yeah that like i started to feel bad for the people that i was fighting yep. and i'll never forget there was this one fight where it was in the middle of the street right in front of my grandma's house this guy's calling me out he's got his little baby brother and his little sister there they're like five years old my brother and my sister are there they're the same age. you way earlier than me then and I'll, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, i get into a fight with him his brother and sister are screaming crying to leave him alone their dogs biting me on the leg i'm still hitting them and and uh whatever i won that fight and then we go our separate ways but then you felt like shit afterwards and i start sitting there i'm like <laughs> i was like dude i was like it hit me that i was actually fighting people who had people who loved them yeah like that's when it like really hit me and then i got into fights after that but every time after that i started to think about them and their loved ones and how they were hurting and what they went through and why they were so bent on like on fighting too and defending themselves and they were insecure too and i start i was empathizing more than right. anything else so i wasn't even in my shoes anymore no, i'm theirs after every fight yeah. and it got to me I so i know what you're talking about bro. so that's when the thing started to shift for me uh, um and what about what about you for me bro yeah i definitely know what you're talking about uh it took a lot it took longer than because when i met you you had to be you were obviously form rolling, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you already had that feeling. Me, uh, nah, man, I uh, unfortunately, I don't know if it was just through uh, my uh, experiences, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of ruthlessness, yeah. experienced a lot of ruthlessness, yeah. and uh, dealt a lot of ruthlessness, on, uh, you know, uh, just because, like I said, saw it, experienced it, ended up dishing it out, just due to the circumstances, because that's just, I, I don't want to say, uh, I don't, I, I, you know, I want you guys to understand something. When we say, or when me at least, and I know my brother, I can, I'm not speaking for him, but we've spoken about this plenty of times, but I'm going to say this. When I say we're victims of circumstance, I'm not making excuses for us. I'm not making, um, you know, I'm not making excuses. I'm not saying, oh, poor us. But you do have to take in consideration that, you know, we ain't bad people. I, I wasn't raised in a bad household where I got taught negative or, you know, bad behavior. Yeah, no. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, when I say that we are victims of circumstances, it's just that like, you know, just that, man. The environment, so the environment that I was brought into, like I, was, like I said earlier, I was born in Michoacan, brought to LA when I was a baby or whatever. Uh, the environment was already like that before I got there, you know? Uh, the environment, South Central Los Angeles was already yeah. fucked up. Yeah. Part of my language, but that's what it was prior to me getting there. I just kind of picked up, you know, like a relay race. It's just a bad cycle. And it's just like, so when I say that we are victims of circumstance or happen, that's what I mean. It's not that yeah. I'm asking for sympathy, sympathy or anything like that. Yeah. But to, 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 uh, what was the question to get that on? Uh, yeah, about about your perspective. When did it start to change? When okay. Did it start to shift? So basically, like I said, you know, I I, I through experiencing a lot of uh, ruthlessness. ruthlessness, I was here, man. And you know what? Honestly, it wasn't until uh, to be real, till my kids were born. Yeah, that's a big one. Where guy was born, fool. That's when that's when I started looking at the world a little yeah. differently. I, I started touching my heart a little bit more. One, I was being I wasn't out and about as much because I wanted to spent time with my boy, with my, with my, with my baby. Uh, I was, you know, starting to fall into that type of lifestyle. Yeah. But to be at, to be honest, to answer your question, bro, just to get to the point of it, I don't remember an exact date or number of age when that happened, but it had to been in my mid twenties. Mm. That yeah, see, and I hadn't thought about that. That having a kid, yeah, they that definitely. Cause you uh, met me. Yeah. Prior and even. Yeah, yeah. I still have that fire in me, bro, so it's just... Well, and see, one of the things that I wanted to mention, too, is, like, when I was growing up, when my dad got out of prison, I was raised... I went from being raised with my mom, really compassionate, creative, 
uh, this feminine energy. Like she just raised me to just be really, really kind and uh, creative and adventurous and everything. Uh, well, then she left. That was amputated. I moved with my my dad. Well, my dad got out of prison, and it was straight to this hyper masculine, fresh out of prison energy. Oh, really? I had to suppress everything I, I had learned with my mother and everything that I had followed with the, with my mother. No more gifted and talented classes, no more talking about art or music or anything like that. I had to suppress all that so that I could be hard and I could follow, literally follow prison rules outside in the world. I had to like live as if you were already like, in prison and they gave you a walkthrough. Mm -hmm. I already had a walkthrough of what to do my first day, my fir not first day in college, first day in prison. This is what you do. This is who you're gonna sit with. This is who you can't sit with. This is who you got to mention. Uh, there were a lot of things that I had to, I, I had to politic, play politics that's in the how streets. You walk, that's how you talk. That's how you walk. That's how you talk. That's how you, this is how you address people. This yeah. is your demeanor. I spent the better part of years not even speaking because everything that I wanted to talk about was like art or something that would seem soft. Yep, yep. So then I told myself, okay, then if I can't be soft or myself, if I have to be hard, then I'm going to be hard, hard and go full throttle with that. And it, it became a survival mechanism. And it also became a way of staying close to my dad and yeah. having love yeah. and, and feeling like I belong. And, and again, survival, survival, yeah. survival. Um, but yeah, then things started to change. Now we're at a point to where you would have to be like, really like coming at me, like to be like, for me to get like physically. Out. Right. It's a, it's Straight right up, yeah. And and the same thing with a lot of our people. Like a lot of our people are just at different points of that evolution. Um, Right. Some of them are getting there. Some of them are still so embedded to where that's the life they've chosen. That's the life they've chosen. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's that. That's there's, that. there's no access point to them right now. There's access, I feel like there's access points to everyone, but they just haven't had that yet. Um, but I feel like right now, yeah. as Chicanos, mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's a lot of us that are opening conversations that are really good for, for us to grow. And we're using that same, what we're doing is channeling that same anger, rebellion, uh, orgullo yeah. into something that, that elevates our people yeah. rather than has us out of conflict or keeps us in the system. And I think this is a great avenue for that. Yeah. I think this is a great avenue for that because, uh, you know, you have, uh, like you said, bro, you have a lot of people like, you know, uh, our age, you know what I'm saying, that are like either trying to make a change or, or they have access points, and that's, that's, that's they want to inter interrupt you. I believe because we have access points to them, but they just—they're so embedded in that their mind is so that. And the exact maybe they're scared to change it. Maybe yeah. they just don't have the uh, tools yet the to tools, do to resources, do resources, so. resources, or resources. they just like you said don't want to, and that's what they chose, and that's what it is. Because some people, some of them just want to root for us. Yeah, from a distance. And yeah, exactly. do your thing, I'm gonna be exactly. in the streets, but do your thing. Do your thing, and but, but it's positive. It's, it's positive, support. and at the same time, it's like it's positive right. support. It's like, all right, cool. Um, but you never know when something's gonna flip in them. Yeah. You never know, so you yep. just keep going. You don't push yep. them too much. Nope. You exactly. show them an example because if you try to push somebody too much, they're gonna put that wall. Ah, all right, well, okay. Now he thinks he's already too good for us. Now you're preaching. Preach. Now you're preaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it, that's another tricky yeah. thing. As Chicanos, we are, it's very it's complex when it comes to like what we're trying to do. What we're trying to express, how we're trying to change, and trying to influence our, our people, because uh, yeah, a lot of them are really already set in their ways, or, or um, you know. But I feel also it, 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 it's good that there's people like us yeah. that genuinely were in the streets yeah. to speak on it and to speak about change. I feel like authenticity is the number one thing when it comes to getting through to people, authenticity, your message. Is it coming from a real place? Is it coming from a place that they can relate uh, to? Um, are you relatable? Um, and are you speaking like genuinely? Yeah, you know, and a lot of people, I think people in general just want genuineness, bro. But yes, uh, you know, people that have been in the street, people that live that life, you know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. There's no such thing as living in the street or living that life and not having to gone through any type of straight bullshit. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, you get crossed, you cross, it things just too positively charged magnet magnets sometimes. Uh, things just topple on top of each other and vice. Either way, there's no such thing as uh, it being easy. Yeah. Um, but 
Fuck, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. No, 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 that's cool. But I, I just feel like that it's really important to share that perspective, you know, so, share the fact that there's there's things that, so many factors that go into play because it's real, it's it's easy to put us on the back burner as uh, criminals or people to write off um, yeah. in society. And, and um, I feel like that's that's an easy, easy way to go about it. And um, what I was trying to get at, I'm not sorry, it's just that, ahead. you know, what I was trying to get at is that, like, you know, anybody who's been through the streets or in the streets or in that life yeah. can or we have that, like, that sixth sense, you could say. I mean, where we can uh, see if you're being real or not. Okay. We're going to we're gonna analyze what you say, how you say it, and why you say it. So, yes, that does have, you know, having lived that life uh, does uh, give you that heightened perception of uh, well, whether they're coming at you genuinely or not. Well, and then that brings up, that brings up something that we don't really talk about is PTSD. Oh, PTSD and mental health when it comes to the way we grew up. Oh, PTSD is one of the biggest anxiety, um, like, uh, like staying on your toe. Oh my goodness! Like me, uh, I mean, just right off top, I mean, any public function. I remember, I used to. Uh, even now, I, I'm really jumpy. I can't hear like loud noises and banging or whatever, because that goes back to like the violence and the domestic violence I was around. Um, but also in the streets, like I never went to a public function in all my teenage years because everything would pop off there. And when I would pull up into a, a gas station, mm -hmm. I would if I was sitting in the car, I have to roll up my windows to where no one can reach in and like, yeah, yeah. or like, or when it's I'm always walking, just or walking yeah. the callejones in the streets, you have to calculate like where the weapons are. Like, okay, somebody runs up on me. Okay, there's a there's a fucking there's a barote right a there. Rock or boom, boom, boom. Something on stick. Or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Like you have to calculate yeah. like like a war zone. Like you're always watching your back, uh, man. To this day, man, I'm always just here. I'm my head. We call it. It's always on, it's always on swivel. I was looking mm -hmm. left to right and back and front. Right yeah, and that's something that's so hard to shake. Like, it's just in there. We don't talk enough about that, like mental health and you know, uh, PTSD. Yeah, uh, you don't touch it. That's just, you know, uh, if I didn't have it before for whatever other reason, uh, I grew up, you know, I went through the riots uh, in 92. Yeah. So now that we're, uh, you know, uh, that thing, they're happening again, or were happening, yeah. um, I, I can relate to all that too, you know. Uh, except mine was, you know, through the, you know, well, 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 the one that happened in my time was through because uh, of Rodney King. Yeah. Well, that's what kicked it off, but there's um, other factors that built up to that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's just like if, if, if anything else, bro, didn't give me PTSD prior to, you know, the riots of 92, that, fucking, riots? that did it, bro. The riots did I mean, it. Why, imagine. Why? why? You, like, okay, how did the riots give you PTSD? Let me recap to that day. April 29th, 1992. So I was living in South Central, but I went to school in this uh, place called, in this part of town of LA called Koreatown, which uh, you might, uh, some of you guys might know a uh, uh, gang uh, that's uh, highly uh, propagated in the media, MS, started. You know, Mara Salvatrucha, that's where it started at, in uh, Koreatown. So that's where I went to school at in, uh, for all my elementary years. Uh, 1992, I, was, I must have been in third grade, maybe, give or take second grade and uh so koreatown from south central is about 25 minutes away give or take depends on where you live but that day i just remember we had kung fu practice with my uncle and uh as we were you know we went from koreatown we went to uh got to south central we went to uh we got to south central we started uh we were about to start practice and whatnot and uh just to kind of hurry up and like put a seal on it a cap on it basically uh on my way well, well they had to cut uh kung fu practice short all right we got so kung fu, we got out of school at 248 uh kung fu practice started at four we got yeah. there about three something give or take whatever we're getting ready warming up it comes out on the radio everybody gotta you know be in by eight you know there's a curfew yeah all the residents of South Central LA need to be in their house by eight, whatever. So, as going home from my uncle's house, which lives in South Central, to our house, to our apartments, there's people jumping on cars, people getting pulled out of cars, people getting beat up, windows being, but all types of just chaos. Yeah. Well, by the time, uh, just, just a little FYI, you know, just a little. Uh, fun fact, 
there was actually, you know, individuals that jumped on our car and like looked in and for some reason they spared us. They, they spared us. And we made it home, like, you know, from two blocks, like two blocks away from where that happened or whatever. And when I got into my safe zone, which what I considered my safe zone, because that was my neighborhood, my area. Uh, and that was in the, uh, either way, when I get there, the liquor store, the, the, the market on the corner is burning. The wires are burning, you know, the electric wires, the phone cables or whatever, just ready to reach the apartment. For some reason, they didn't. But like I said, that that was very uh, tripped out in itself. How old were you now? Shit, nine, uh, eight going on nine. Damn. A month before you I turned nine. that clearly, huh? Oh, I remember everything. So it's just like, you know, and there's a lot of other things that uh, happened that, uh, you know, trip you out, but a lot of it was normal to me, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's still, now that you think back on it, it's like, shit, that ain't normal. Uh, all right, so that's one part of the riots. Then, like, a couple of days later, you hear, like, fucking, like, you. I thought it was an earthquake, because you heard the, the earth, the ground rumbling. You just hear, well, it's fucking the, what do you call it, the National Guard, bro? Oh, yeah, yeah. National Guard fucking. The helicopter? Uh, no, vehicles. Oh. National Guard vehicles rolling through the streets, you know, from city streets. So, and, you know, they got 50 caliber, you know, guns mounted. And, you know, I, I've heard gunshots before. I've seen violence before and whatnot. But that really tripped me out, dog. And that just kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, that, I think it'll do something to your head. Yeah, see, and I hadn't even thought about that. Like, I never had to deal with, like, going through any riots or anything like that. It was just a regular day-to-day -day stuff. Oh, yeah, that, nah. that was just the, the PTSD. And like I said, the street stuff and the domestic stuff. Okay, that'll uh, do it too. That'll do it too, though. But, but, but it leaves us with that. You know <laughs> what I mean? It leaves, that, that's, I think that's one of the longest lasting effects of everything. Because you can change your life. You can go make, you know, whatever changes. Get in and out of jail. Do your time. Change your life. The PTSD is the most insidious thing that sticks with you. Because you don't even know what, what the, what's going to trigger it. Sure. And like me, for for me, loud noises are a banging, like right off top. Any kind of banging or something triggers it because then I you get into fight know. mode, like that. Yeah, and and it's weird though. But like I said, at the end of the day, we're at a point now where I think it's really important to start like having these conversations and letting people know what our realities were mm -hmm. and what, kind of what shaped our decision making and how we're finding our way back to to. Uh, to, to um, empathy and morality and uh, progress and, and change and positivity and how, how we're trying to spread that back to, to our people. You yeah. know what I mean? And make that contagious. Yeah. yeah. So like- That's definitely what this is about. So lastly, like real quick, um, this picture, I didn't share it, but it's a picture of my son. It's one of the first pieces I, I, I made. And if you look close, you can't see it, but it's like charcoal or pastel. And it's just, it's my son. My son's half white and he's uh, half, half Mexican, but uh, it's just him there alone. And at first I wondered what this piece meant, but I look at it and it's me wondering what the future is for him. Like, what does the future mean for him? Um, like, so luckily he's not growing up in the same environment, Straight up. but he is, he is, a, a, you know, if they want to look at him in a certain way, he is a, a brown kid if they want to look at him specifically like that. Well, they can, and he's um, you categorize that, I guess you could say. And, and also, he symbolizes all of our kids, our upcoming kids, the next generation, the new generation, um, your kids. Like, it's, my question now is like, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does everything mean now for our kids and the future generations? Like, the, everything going on with immigration, um, everything going on uh, with uh, racial inequality and the fights that are happening now, I think they're really important. The Black Lives Matter movement, I feel like I was inspired by that because it taught me um, how peoples can come together. And I felt like we hadn't been doing enough, like me especially, I'm not talking about all of us, but we hadn't been doing enough to um, educate and inform. I agree, I agree. And, and educate and inform our own people Absolutely, man. on our own history, mm -hmm. on our language, our culture, our heritage, and uh, learning more about our uh, 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 anything, any any kind of issues that we have, and spreading awareness, yep. right? Yep. And then also like building bridges between like us and like like I said, um, ex convicts and people that went, got caught up in the system. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like we hadn't been doing enough, and I was inspired by by the Black Lives Matter movement, and I support 100% everything that they're doing as though. Um, 
And again, it has me questioning like, okay, what's next? What's next for us? What's next for everyone? Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And what do you see? What do you see as, what's, you know, what's next for us? What do you see as our job um, going through whatever we've been through, yeah. being fathers, yep. being, um, you know, figures in the community uh, in whatever capacity? What do you see as a, as a future for us or next steps that we should take? First and foremost, our job, as like you said, father, it all starts at home. If you're a father, I'm not going to tell you what to do. For me as a father, it all starts at home with my kids first. Mm -hmm. You got to get yourself, I mean, we're, we're a work in progress as well. Yeah, we, yeah we both absolutely. Are. So, but with that being said, it's like you have to teach your kids what, you know what I'm saying? You got to start with, with home. Yeah. Once you have a proper footing at home, then we got to branch out to, like you said, bro, mm -hmm. uh, basically what I think, what I feel we need to do is just like I said, we start at home, spread out eventually you go yeah. to the community yeah and from the community i mean it's yeah further on i yeah, see and i agree with that like me i like i said i'm very honest with my son about uh my upbringing what i've gone through my fuck ups and uh my my learning along the way and also um i started a bunch of things for my community for down in texas mm -hmm. um, oh yeah you did yeah I murals a bunch of community initiatives because i'm trying to um, spread awareness uh, in my town and again inform and educate and do all that in my city in whatever capacity um, just grassroots level doing whatever I can with what I have at the moment and uh, growing along the way uh, I feel like that's one of the biggest things finding that pride and remembering like you know because there's that balance of being American but also being Latinx being Chicano being, um, so you know, it's definitely a uh, balancing act. It definitely is a balancing act. I didn't want to say a conflict or a, you know, inter no. it's a balancing act. Yeah, most definitely. But I feel like educating ourselves. Yeah, and just keep keep going and, and educating ourselves to our our own yes. issues and history and other people. Yes, it, 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 absolutely. Go ahead, bro. Go. No, 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 and, and just that, and then just sharing that with our with our kids and with the community and, and opening discussions, conversations. I know? mean, you pretty much said it in other and just a different words. Like I said, it starts at home. Educate your kids if you have them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you gotta educate yourself first. Educate your kids. If they, if you educate them, they're probably more likely to educate somebody else. Mm -hmm. Then you go out and educate everybody or whoever you can. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, no, the the thing is, is just constant updating and upgrading. Yeah. Constant up, uh, not physical, but mental updating yeah. and upgrading. And these discourses definitely, I believe, make a difference. Yeah. And speaking of the discourses, we are now, uh, yeah, we, we uh, pretty much covered a lot. And, uh, but uh, we are opening it up now to uh, questions, any kind of discussion. Hi, hey, moms. <laughs> and, uh, we, would love, we would love to hear any questions. Like, if you have anything, anything you want to bring up, wow, let us know. Right there. Tell them about fart blitz. <laughs> I know, I know, I see them, bro. I see them, I see them. He came on just to say that. All right, yeah. Y'all got any questions? Y'all got any uh, anything y'all want to bring up? Anything we didn't cover? Uh, y'all want details on um, anything? You know. That's <laughs> what. Y'all ask, we answer. Let me see if uh. I'm to How did you two meet? Well, you want to answer that? Or... Uh, you go ahead. All right. We, we, well, we basically, like he said earlier, we uh, met through mutual friends. And uh, we actually were going to, we, we didn't get along at first, you know. Uh, we butted heads just because of our ego. Yeah. And uh, that's just basically how we kicked off. And then after that, I mean, we figured we kind of liked each other. And we just went from there. Uh, but yeah, that was back when I barely moved here, like in like early 2000. Uh, no, actually, I touched down here the first time, like in 98, 99. That's when I met him. I went back to LA, moved to uh, Minnesota, to, I mean, to Rochester, ran into him again. And yeah, no, um, and that's how we met. We met like that, and uh, we hung out on and off the whole time and uh we would see each other we wouldn't see each other for like a year and then hang out like nothing like yeah like, like 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 just kick 
<laughs> but, and I was like, just like yesterday. But then we will, uh, then he started to see my transition into the arts. I started to see my art shows. And I was like, hey, bro, I'm doing this art thing. Like, it's really happening. Like, and, like shit's popping off. And he's like, man, keep doing your thing, bro. And yeah. I had people like make fun of me or like not take it seriously or whatever. But Lalo was always like, even though we had never talked about art, it was all street yep, stuff. It was all, when know. I brought up art, he was just like, didn't skip a beat. He's like, do your thing. Keep doing your thing, bro. Like, badass. And, uh, and then when I started holding my art shows and festivals, he would pop up straight up just go in he even worked a couple of the doors sometimes get the, the uh the fee or whatever the, the cover charge and he would just chill there and um yeah so he actually has been a friend of mine like throughout the transition throughout the growth and has grown with me and our conversations have grown along the way yeah so we knew each other prior to his art thing uh like like you said people used to make fun of him because uh he used to literally live in a trailer and like have a uh, cardboard that he collect from the garbage cans or whatever and uh start painting stuff and i mean we'd be sitting there you know chilling drinking kicking it and uh i was just like man you know what dog you got something keep going yeah so that's just kind of if that answers that that question I, anybody else yeah um i'm really curious about um the the charcoal watercolor paintings that you showed at the beginning um mm -hmm. I, I think they're beautiful, first of all, but I, I'm wondering about your choice of how you presented both the background and the person, because it seems like the background is more detailed, but doesn't have color, while the, like, the portrait is colorful, but like has less detail. So I was wondering if you could expand on like why you chose those like styles. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, I wanted, for one, the contrast to be, the color and everything to be, to represent kind of like the, it was more of a reality. This was more of a, 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 more of a fantasy, like, it was more of like a suggestion, like an idea, like, you know, it, it hints more at, at imagination and it was done a lot with like a more of a gestural feel. Like if you were to look closer, it's more of a gestural feel. So it's like a, it's like a fleeting idea, like what if I end up changing my life? What if I end up changing my social, my, my, my social landscape, my, my outlook, my perspective, and people's perspective of me, my context as a human being? What if, you know? So the background in charcoal, gestural, is more of like the, the what if, the what, what could be, you know? And this is more of like a solid state, I guess you could say like, hey, this is the reality right now. Um, uh, but this is what could be, yeah. And I like the contrast. I like the just, just the, you know, color and just not, you know, I just wanted to be free. Um, and I like playing with the charcoal where you just like, kind of can just smudge a little bit and hint at the rest, you know? Yeah, I really like that. Anybody else? So I was gonna ask you guys since, um, you have, I mean, Bobby, obviously, I know a lot about your work and don't know as much about Lyle's, but um, the question would be, do you feel invigorated or an extra layer of pressure given that you have platforms to speak about injustice and identity and some of the very complicated issues that are kind of just beating this society down a little bit a really good question. Mm -hmm. can i kind of look briefly yeah. just to kind of give him a little platform on that mm -hmm. uh, no i look first and foremost i uh i uh i do art in different forms i write music or used to or kind of delve into delve in that little situation however uh bobby he's the uh you know the artist the painter and whatnot uh to to, to uh, okay. i dabble no, he dabbles, he says. <laughs> no, but look, to answer your question as far as the uh, pressure, uh, I, I, I don't think it's extra pressure or uh, pressure beyond just through the aspect, like for me, I, I, I write rap. So it has to, it, it speaks about injustices, it speaks about the social structure. It's, you know, we, it, it has to cover that, at least my music does. And uh, I don't, I, I'll let him answer for himself. Good question though. Um, I feel, 
absolutely positively invigorated by the platform by having a platform and I, this is what like i worked for like for so long this is what i imagined this is this is why we do it if we don't do it like to create ripples then why are we doing why it you know it? Yeah. and and it's like i've always like been hesitant to give myself permission to have that kind of like like uh to feel like i've done enough to speak with or to or for people right i'm like oh, i don't know if i've done enough i don't know if they respect my word enough i don't know if i put in enough work uh but that's a frustrated artist okay? <laughs> that, you would have no, been an artist if you weren't that, frustrated come on man. but but i feel you like know? i mean i've i've had enough um you know enough uh interaction with with people to know that they do entrust me with the voice Oh, yes. with for uh with and for them um so yeah i feel like like when i give myself that full permission because i was always like okay be humble that's how we were raised be yeah, humble absolutely. just chill yeah. just chill don't, don't be too big-headed because then yeah. You know, yeah yeah no 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 now it's like bro like yeah. that are ready to speak. Uh, what the hell this is uh yeah this is like the time to do it give yourself that permission to be like no you are the one you are the one you're one of the ones not just the only one but you're one of the ones you have a platform people respect you you put in put in work um like why why waste that like yeah, exactly. no 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 so now it's like oh i'm hyped about it a hundred percent like yeah, I can't wait to see what's next. <laughs> yeah, definitely is invigorating. Okay. Um, somebody commented, um, E. Rutherford, um, thanks for a really amazing talk. Okay, I uh, love your work. And how you both have talked, okay, can you talk more about your transition? Transition to the art thing, as you put it, especially in relation to what you talked about earlier with your dad and having to cut off your relationships to things like art and other things that may be considered soft. Okay, so, uh, so my transition into art. Um, so I was up, up in Minnesota, been here. I was in, um, I, 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 I reached the point where I was in kind of like a domestic life. You know, I had a relationship for like four years. I was at a factory job for the same amount of time um but it was killing me the factory job was killing me and uh i i remember i got written up for drawing and sketching and all kinds of stuff and i used to like dream about doing art but anyway four yeah, years of that four years later i reached a point where i unfortunately had to leave the relationship uh we parted ways um just, still good terms you know unless my son she's amazing uh parted ways with the relationship parted ways with the job within the same week and I, I left to Texas. I didn't know what I wanted to do in life, right? Art still wasn't in the, in the forefront. I left to Texas for three weeks, ended up stuck there for three months, right? Um, so I'm there three months. I hadn't seen my son. I lost my car. I lost my money. I owed people money. I just crashed and burned, partied, doing drugs. I just crashed and burned, right? Okay, and I share this story with like my, when I talk to at-risk youth and stuff too. So. I reached this point, right, this day, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't wanna live anymore. I feel like I have nothing left to offer life. You know, I had nothing left to offer, hadn't seen my son, no money, I didn't wanna go back to that factory. And I feel like I have nothing left to give to society, right? And so I was like, I could literally end it all already now. I have nothing, I go and I was like, I could end it all right now. I was mentally saying my goodbyes and everything. And, and I told myself, I'm like, well, okay, this is when it clicked. I'm like, well, if I can already end it now and I feel like I have nothing left to lose, then I have nothing left to lose. Then what if, and that's when it hit me. I was like, what if I turn life into this fucking experiment where I take that, where I take that one little thing that I was like, what is the one little sliver of hope in my life? I'm like, 
Well, I still like to draw. I always like to make stuff since I was a kid. I'm like, what if I take that little sliver of hope and apply every cliche I had ever fucking heard in life? Like the, uh, put your mind to it, you can do it. Whatever your dreams are, it's possible, blah, 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 blah. All that Disney Channel shit. I was like, what if that's real? I was like, I go, I got nothing left to lose now. So why not take that and try to see how far it takes me? I got nothing left. You could always, I could always end my life on another day. Like, I'm, 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 I'm glad, to, tell you, but I'm glad to say I've never looked back and I've never thought about that again. But check it out. That's what I thought. So from then on out, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go with the art. What do I love? What do I love? And how can I just go full throttle? What can I say like yes to 100%? And it was that. And I made up my mind and I wrote it on a letter. And on my way back on the Greyhound bus, I still have this letter. I wrote down, I was like, I don't know if people are ready for my art or my story or whatever, but I'm gonna go full throttle with this art thing, see how far it goes. Um, I hope they're ready for my story, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I got here, I got in Minnesota. I started jumping into cardboard dumpsters using house paints, making my own paint brushes with ripped up rags, painting a, a true story, like nailing my, my cardboard shit like all over the, the, all around here at the art center nailing my artwork to the trees in the back, drawing in the snow for the art center to see my work. <laughs> I had like my Tumblr on there. It was crazy. But uh, hey, can I say something quick? I've seen cardboard paintings manifest themselves onto like utility boxes around the city, <laughs> walls, buildings. Uh, so, so that's what happened. And then I just started going full throttle. And then I was like, well, I want to show my art in public. And I was there in the basement at my sister's house because that's where I had moved out to. And I'm there telling myself like, okay, I'm gonna be, oh, I'm gonna be an artist one day. People aren't really gonna care about what I'm thinking, what I have to say. And I just start, it was delusional. So no one was there to tell me it was gonna happen. It was delusional. And I started like, just, just like that and just taking it all in. And uh, I just kept going and I was like, well, I wanna show my art in public. So let me grab my paintings, go outside downtown, set my alarm for seven in the morning. Like I had a real job, go on the bus. <laughs> That's what I started doing, and then we started holding my own art shows, and then applying for things, and you know, then we yeah, started cool, going, yeah. you know, and uh, slowly started. And that was in Minnesota. So my dad's in Texas. So what my dad ended up, what ended up happening with my dad is like, you know, now I chill with my dad, you know, and he's he's seen all this growth. He's seen everything that's happened, and he uh he uh like is super proud of it. Oh, yeah. At first he didn't know, he didn't know how to accept it. But now he's like, he loves that. He was at my first art blitz in, in Texas. I did a festival for my hometown. He's like, I mean, he was like crying there. He had a, the Rovis shirt. Cause I also started a clothing brand down there. He had the clothing stuff. He supports everything I do. And uh, so now it's more of life on, on, on our terms as our real selves, you know, and me as my real self, um, which is a lot more genuine between you know, so our relationship between him and I is, is a lot more genuine. That's dope. And uh, yeah, that's what we are now. Anybody? Better up. Are we good? Anybody else? Oh, let me take the thing. Can I say something? Oh, 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 oh. yes, you can. Yes, you may. Well, yes, you can. I have more of a comment than a question. I figured that. I've seen you both from the beginning. I might, I might say that at the beginning I was questionable about this little friendship. But Lalo, I'm the first to say that you're one of very few that I can say about his homeboys that have always supported him. No matter what, you've been to all his shows that you've been possibly able to go. And you've always been extremely proud of him. And for that, I love you. Now, I've seen you all through y'all's little trials and tribulations. Thank you, And I can also say that I'm extremely proud of where y'all are at, how humble y'all have stayed, and how y'all never forgot about your homies that got stayed behind and your family. Absolutely. And I just want people to understand that, like Bobby, you're a great artist. You put all your effort in, Dalo, you've done your stuff, you, you support my people, but you all never forgot your friendship and your friends that yeah. have stayed behind and are still lost 
and I'm proud of you guys because you don't do it just for y'all. You do it for all the, the friends that are still struggling, that are still, you know, on drugs or in prison or whatever. I don't see them as, as you know, inmates or, or anything. Those are your friends. Those are your family. That's your, your, your homeboys. And that's what I'm most proud of. How humble you are. You won't forget. On the real, though. That from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love. Well, your mom is very proud of you, so I just want people to know. Much love, mom. <laughs> y'all was, y'all was giving me, ya casi, ya casi, eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got, so we got any questions? We got any other questions? I do have a question. All right. So you, so you both mentioned PTSD. Would you say that um, diagnoses such as PTSD go undiagnosed in a Chicano community or Chicano families? And if so, why you think it goes undiagnosed? And how is this affecting you both um, now? All right, I'm just going to briefly tap on that. Well, first of all, hi, and thank you for asking. Uh, yes, I do believe it goes highly undiagnosed. Uh, in my case, I'm going to say it was, you know, because uh, I was an immigrant child. And um, I didn't have like medical or any uh, medical assistance or anything of that sort, of that nature until further, way further down the line. Uh, that's a different story for a different time if uh, God, you know, presents the opportunity. But, uh, but the whole point is, yes, I, th I believe it does go highly undiagnosed due to uh, economical circumstances. Uh, two is cultural, or that could be one, or however you want to put it. Cultural due to the fact that, uh, you know, like, like bro was saying earlier, like uh, you, you know, growing up in a Latino, Mexican or a Latino family, or, you know, just my case being Mexican, uh, it, 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 some of those, you know, uh, symptoms for are, are, are looked at as weaknesses or like as form of like you acting up or just being, you know what I mean? Just so, it, it, so like I said, I think it's economical, cultural, and uh, I'm, I'm sure if I think about it, I could think of another think of too, but yeah. No, that, that hits it right on the money too. Like, it's stigmatized. Yeah. It's hands down. For us, it's soft. Like, yeah. that, that goes back yeah. to being like, soft. Like, like, what do you mean? What? Uh, nah, you suck it up. What do you mean you want to go see a therapist? What do you mean yeah. you're jumpy? What do you mean you have anxiety? What? You better suck that shit. Yeah, like, you better suck and that. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's super stigmatized. And like, I think about that, like, I think about that with my son. Like, my son has anxiety issues and everything. And I've, like, thought about it. It's like, I try to help him on my own. I try to do a lot of things. But I'm like, I also have reached a point to where it's like, maybe he does need to go see someone to help him cope better. Um, but that was also, like, a thing that I was like, oh, does he really, really need it? But then I caught myself. I'm like, wait, is that just me and my childhood, my upbringing, stepping in and getting in the way of my son's betterment? Um, because it was always in the way of my own. And that was the thing, especially, especially, it would be like a, it would be like a, like a blow, a, such a big blow to us if like some of our homeboys or somebody, they found out that we had gone to a counselor. Yeah. It, like, or, or like we went to go get meds for anxiety. Yeah, or, you know, if we were popping meds, anxiety meds, Xanax and all that, that was just cool for fun. We could self-medicate, but if we were popping like prescriptions or like we went to go see a counselor. Well, I gotta go see my counselor, so like, or, like you're liable to go. like, hey bro, good. hey man, like I'm not feeling good right now. Like I have anxiety, like no. That's one of the biggest problems. And yeah, I feel like that's what it is. Like Lala was saying, you know, it's it's economic yep. um, or like that, your, your legal status yep. um, or like that. It, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, you know, cultural, social. I mean, it's just uh, like, 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 like I said, okay, first of all, not having uh, access to uh, proper or professional help, that's one. That could be through uh, economical or just circumstantial, just like with was uh, an immigrant and, and I, I was poor. We were poor growing up. Yeah. So that, that was double whammy. And uh, then another thing is cultural, you know, like in your house or your, your family, that's social. Where you go out, you're going to be like, you know, well, I got to go see my therapist. I'm like, what? You know? Even if it wasn't in the streets, like. A lot Even of in your house, it's not enough. Tend to be like, or a lot of it like to be. Ah, yeah, like, exactly. Ah, what? Like, you know, down, downplay so, it, and uh, that's what it is. Yeah, cultural. Yeah. I mean, if that answers your question at all, or I mean, if you have any other parts of that, we'll, yeah, I think that was good.
Okay, cool. Does that make sense? Does that answer? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. I mean, let me know if you know what I mean. Want me to elaborate further? If not, anybody else? Anybody else? Maybe we have it. We covered a lot. We covered some good stuff. Anybody else have questions before we log out? Or uh, I think this was really great. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys. Thank you both so so much. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Nervous. I'm not gonna lie, but uh. <laughs> To be honest, I, I, I kind of look forward to another one if possible, you know, and uh Yes. Uh, we'll do it. You're hired. We want to do another one. I have to think about this for like three weeks and then I'm gonna have a bunch of questions. All right. So cool. nice to meet you, Lalo. Thank you, Bobby. Oh, yeah. and your new work is so good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be yeah. sharing soon. Thank okay. you. Everybody. Thank you guys. Thank you. It was it was Thank an honor. You guys. Bye -bye. Yes. Yeah, have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Ama. Love you. Good night, Mijo. Love you. Ay, ¿te, ¿Te gustó? Sí, hagan más. <laughs> Dice, te estás saludando al carnal. Okay. Hagan <laughs> más. Love you. 